We are steadily moving through Acts, the 24th chapter. Steadily moving through Acts, the 24th chapter. Good evening. And uh, we're going to hopefully get through all of that this evening. Amen. If you have it, say amen. amen. God is a good God. Yes, he is. Amen. Acts 24th chapter. As you know, the Apostle Paul in these previous chapters has been up against it. He has been experiencing some major difficulties uh, for following the Lord, for serving the Lord, for being a Christian. And, and the early church, and this is what the Acts of the Apostles is about, not to reteach any of the, the lessons, but can anyone tell me kind of what I said about the book of Acts being between the four Gospels. So the first four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then the book of Acts, it's called the Acts of the Apostles, and then all of the letters, so to speak, in the book of Revelation at the end. What is, what is the book of Acts' purpose or its reason for being placed there between the four Gospels and the Epistles. Anybody remember? You used a fancier term, but isn't it like the pivotal point? Thank you. She said it right. It is the pivot point. Anybody ever played basketball? Nobody in here played basketball? Okay. Oh, we got one basketball player coming I want, in. I want All right. good though, oh, okay. <laughs> so you know what your pivot leg is or your pivot foot. It's the once you picked up your dribble. It's the foot you could spin on. Now, it's no coincidence, but, but I just got to thinking. I watched about five, six, seven minutes while I rested uh, during some little bit of lunchtime, and I was working in the yard today, and I saw probably one of the uh, uh, greatest players ever uh, to play, and his name was Hakeem Olajuwon. He was a great pivoter. He was a great pivoter. He could pivot and fake people out and get to the basket. So a pivot point is a turning point. A turning point, all right? Everybody still with me? And the turning point or the transition point is the book of Acts. It moved from kingdom, uh, the preaching of the kingdom, and to the beginning of the early church. All right, so the Apostle Paul, who had been a persecutor of the church, is now the one that is being persecuted. Okay? The Apostle Paul, that was a persecutor of the church, is now the one that is being persecuted. Why is he being persecuted? Why is he being, why is he being done wrong? Yes, sir. Hey, all right. Amen. He had given his life to the Lord, and because he had given his life to the Lord, he was doing what the Lord wanted him to do. And then you said standing on the word. he was standing on the word. He was preaching the gospel. And what have I said, just as a review, what have I said about the gospel? It will either drive you, or it will draw you. What does that mean? If it will drive you, it can make enemies. Sometimes preaching and, and sharing God's word does not make people feel good. <laughs> it makes them feel a little bit uncomfortable. And you'll see that in the lesson today. And it will, it will push people. It will challenge you. But also the gospel has a way of drawing you in. And, and if you have been drawn in, then that's... That's how you were saved, right? You were saved by the gospel and the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. So here we are in chapter 24. 
We left off last week in chapter 23 where Paul had been brought before a council and he had experienced some things and he was going through some, some pivotal moments and they had to sneak him out of town. All right, because they were that mad at him. They had to sneak him out of town and then they brought him and then it says in verse one, and after five days of waiting, Ananias, the high priest, descended with the elders that came down from Jerusalem and with a certain orator named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence, we accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness, notwithstanding that I uh, be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou wouldest hear us of thy clemency a few words. For we have found this man, a pestilent fellow, and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Verse 6 says, who, is also, who also have gone about to profane the temple whom we took uh, and would have judged according to our law. But the chief captain, Lysias, came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come unto thee by examining of whom thyself mayest take knowledge of all these things whereof we accuse him. Uh, and the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. Let's stop there for just a few moments. So finally, Paul is before Felix. Okay? Now, if you understand who some of these people are, if you look at your handout, you see that Felix is the governor of that area. All right? And so he could hear the case because uh, Paul was, if you remember, uh, Gosh, back in verse 34 of chapter 23, he was of the province or of the area of Cilicia. So it was under Felix's uh, uh, governing. All right. So he is a governor of this area. But now get this. These are Jews accusing a Jew to a man bringing his case before a man who they hate. So the hypocrisy is is pretty interesting. It's pretty interesting. They hate Felix, but evidently they hate Paul more <laughs> because of the gospel. Because notice what's happening in the beginning of these verses. Tertullus, which is basically their lawyer, uh, he is, is flowering or flattering uh, Felix up. You ever been flattered before? Can I ask you this way? Have you ever been flattered and you knew the person flattering you was trying to get something over on you? Have you ever had somebody try to butter you up like you were a roll? Have you ever been drawn in and they were flattering you? You thought, man, they, they like me, only to find out maybe they didn't like you. Sometimes flattery can be a good thing, I guess, but I'm thinking about the fact, good evening, about the fact that, that sometimes, like what the Aesop fable said, the fox came along and saw the crow up in the uh, tree with a big piece of cheese. And if you remember Aesop's fables, as he was speaking to the crow, notice this, he, he flattered him and said, come on, crow, sing, sing us a song. You, you, you have a beautiful voice. And the crow sitting there with a the mouth full of cheese. And finally, he got the crow to, to open up his mouth and when he opened his mouth to sing, and you know crows can't sing, they're not songbirds, the cheese dropped down and the fox took off. Flattery is, is not all it's cracked up to be. So here Tertullus is flattering Felix because they want him to uh, condemn Paul. That's the only reason, all right? So the Jews hate Paul, they hated Paul, and this lasted quite some time. They had waited five days for uh, Ananias and the rest of them to get there. Tertullus uses uh, flattery. And, and, and really, if you look at your handout, it says 
in con keeping in consistency with how many politicians are today. Now, if you are a politician in here, I apologize. I'm not talking about you. Or am I? Amen. Many politicians and many people, let's just put it that way. Let's just say people. People will say what you want to hear so they can get what they want to get. All right? So they were spinning the truth to try to get their, their, their advantage. Uh, Tertullus is basically, he is spreading it on thick. All right? Notice what he says, too. He said, you have made many, I'll put it in my own words, many great reforms. Acts, the 24th chapter. Many great reforms in our country. Now, keep in mind, they hated Felix. So why would they be giving him some props? Because they're really disliking. They're trying to get rid of the Apostle Paul. Felix was only a governor. He, he was the only governor who had worked up from, get this, from being a slave. All right? All the other governors had, had their positions, maybe family. But Felix had been a slave, so he had seen the, the I guess you could say, the violent end of life. So get this, they are lathering him up, but notice this, if you look at history, and, and many times you can use books to go along with scripture, Josephus is, is, is pretty accurate. Felix was hated because he loved to murder Jews. So this makes it even more interesting with the simple fact that they are lathering him up, seeing that he, is a, he has killed many Jews, but they are so angry at Paul, they'll do anything, say, anything to get him killed, to get him condemned. How many of you in here know, though, that even as Paul stands there, he recognizes all this. I'm sure the Holy Spirit is showing him. How many of you know that the truth will set you free? Back it up to chapter 23 and understand what had the Lord already said to him in red letters. He said, you will make it to Rome to preach. Guess where he is? He's in Jerusalem, correct? Amen. He's not going to die in Jerusalem. <laughs> He's going to go to Rome. So the Lord stood by him in chapter 23, verse 11. Be of good cheer, Paul. I am with you. And tonight I'm standing by you and I'm going to let you know what you have desired all the time to get to Rome and preach in front of those people and to share the gospel, I'm going to allow it to happen. So Paul is standing there and he knows it's not going to end here in Jerusalem. Doesn't matter how much they lather up Felix, it doesn't matter how much they lie, how much they twist the truth, the truth will set you free. I have an interesting question at the end or a statement at the end of, of note for verses two through four. Why are people bound in countries around the world We've been preaching about it on Sunday mornings. It's the absence of truth. People are bound because they don't know what the truth of God's word is. It is the absence of truth in government, in leadership, in society, in families. Let me go even a step further. In churches. Amen. Preach the truth. Teach the truth. Believe the truth. Live the truth. Share the truth. Amen. Verses five and six. Notice uh, how they describe Paul. Now they didn't butter up Felix, but notice they're not buttering up Paul. They, they called him a pest. <laughs> the, the word behind that is, I think it's in your handout, is is a plague. Lord have mercy. We just have come through and kind of somewhat still experiencing uh, this plague that we have gone through this this virus, this pandemic. To call somebody a plague, that's a strong word. Paul's a plague. He is a creator of dissension. He is a ring leader. Lord have mercy. He's a ring leader. All right? He is a, a, a stirrer up. Then they said he is of the sect of the Nazarenes. And that's a reference to where Jesus grew up. Now, keep this in mind. If you, if you remember in John, write this down. John, the first chapter, verse 46. One of the disciples, uh, maybe Nathaniel, if I'm not mistaken, uh, says of Jesus from where he is. 
and he says he's of Nazareth, then he says, what good thing can come from Nazareth? What does that mean? Nazareth was looked down upon. Nazareth was the, was the New Testament version of the Old Testament. What was that town? Lodabar. Y'all remember Deacon Piles' message on Lodabar? Lodabar was the lowest of the low. If you were from Lodabar, you were a mess. It was a mess. It was a, a cast down area. Well, Nazareth was pretty much the same thing, prompting one of the disciples to say, oh my goodness, he's from Nazareth. What good can come from Nazareth? So notice they are associating Paul with a sect of the Nazarenes, of the lowdowns. Amen? These sentiments are held strongly, again, according uh, to, to today's societal standards, that Christians are looked down on, just like they're casting down on Paul. Don't think for one minute, because you are a Christian, that, that you are looked nicely upon. You say that often, Pastor. What, what's going on? Look at the world around you. Christians are quickly becoming blamed frequently for all sorts of ills. Because if we are in a world where right is wrong and wrong is right and we stand on the right side of truth, what does that make us according to the world's standards? Wrong. And then if you're wrong, then it's your fault for the ills that are happening in society. What they don't understand, it is literally the Christians that, that the true blood-washed, born-again believers that are filled with the Holy Spirit that are standing between what is judgment and... And, 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 and what the Lord could do and we are praying that he will save and help and, and cleanse and heal our country and our world. We're the buffers but we're wrong. I've heard it. I've seen it. Y'all get to watch some videos look at the news. This lady on the news stood up the other day and said I don't care about your Bible. I don't care about your mythical God. I don't care about any of that. I don't want to hear it. Exactly what she said. We are considered, now watch this very carefully. Minister Smith shared this with me about seven years ago. There were some laws that went into place. Technically, with your radical beliefs in a radical book, you are technically what they call an extremist. Look it up. Yeah. <laughs> you probably just marked that on the video. Oh, well. But that's what you are. You are. If you believe that, then guess what? You, you are considered that. They are trying to lump the Apostle Paul in with the group of thieves and, and, and lawbreakers, and he has not broken the law. Amen. Anybody in here been ever been called an antagonist? Maybe in the workroom? Amen. Have you ever been called a disturber of the peace? Maybe in your neighborhood? Let me tell you something. If you stand for what's right, you could be under the, under the gun, so to speak, for what is called character assassination. Jesus told us very simply, if they hated me, they will hate you. We don't like to hear that. We like to be liked. We like to be popular. We like to be in the in crowd. But if let me tell you one more time, if you name the name of Christ, there could be a possibility that you will not be. Amen. The Apostle Paul is being called everything but a child of God. <laughs> All right. So now we get to verse 7 and we see what they say. The chief captain Lysias came upon us with great violence, took him away out of our hands. And then they, they get down and they say uh, that, that the Jews also assented saying these things were true after that as they were examining him. So another falsehood intended, they were lying on Paul, intended to shift the blame, to pass the buck, to shift the blame for the incident. And actually, if you remember, if go back to chapters 23, read them again if you get a moment, chapter 22, it was not Paul that started the riot. It was not Paul that put the mob together. It was the Jewish people that did that. And they were, they were trying, and when the, the Roman soldiers, detachment, centurions, found out about it, they snatched Paul up and took him up into the castle because they would have ripped him apart. It was not Paul that incited 
any of these things, but they are lying about him, saying that he is guilty of starting violence. Lysias is the one that actually put a stop to the riot and rescued Paul. Verse 10. Then Paul, after that, the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. He said, I'm going to defend myself because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city, neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confessed unto thee, that after, there's our term, what's our term? The way. What is that short for? What is the way? Christianity. Belief in Jesus Christ. Belief in the fact that he, he died, he was buried, and he resurrected. He rose again. So Paul, that's what they call this. We see this term multiple times in the book of Acts. The way. But after the way, which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written <clears throat> in the law and the prophets. And have what? Hope. Toward God, which they themselves also allow that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Do you remember when Paul last week attached himself and said, I'm a Pharisee? Can anybody in here remind themselves and tell the rest of the, the room, the class tonight, what was one of the major differences between the Pharisees and the Sadducees? You often hear about them in Scripture. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, yes. You got it. Nailed it. Thank you, brother. Pharisees believed that Christ had risen. They believed in the resurrection, but the Sadducees did not. All right? They, they did not believe in anything except things that were literally tangible. They don't believe what they could hear, see, touch, taste, smell. Don't tell me about no spirits, no demons, no angels, nothing like that. They didn't believe in that. Now, Pharisees believed in the spirit a world. They believed in the resurrection. Now, but they did not believe that Christ rose. Amen? So, Paul attached himself to the fact that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was born a Pharisee of Pharisees. All right? Now notice this. Paul, starting out, he avoids any flattery. Unlike uh, Tertullus. Paul didn't try to flatter and butter up Felix. He just simply spoke the truth. Can I pause and give you some application here if everybody's with me tonight? Watch this. You don't have to match up what the world does. The world has all sorts of different methods, and they will do what they're going to do. But what we must do is what Paul did. Tell the truth. Stand on the truth. Don't cave to the culture. Don't lie. Tell the truth. You don't have to flatter. You don't have to, to match what the world does. It might, it might have been very tempting for Paul to try to say, you know what, they're trying to paint a a great case against me. Maybe I better try to get on the side of the judge as well. No, Paul knew what side he was on. He was on the right side. He was on God's side. He did not try to flatter. He just simply told the truth. Yeah, I worship. Yeah, I worship the God of the Old Testament that sent his son and his son rose from the dead. That's who I worship. The God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. He's saying, I believe the scriptures. And I also believe in the one who fulfilled scripture. Amen. Amen. Now, <clears throat> we left off at, let's see. Verse 16. Yes. Yes. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience 
void of offense toward God and toward men. Now, that is a wonderful verse. Paul spoke about conscience last week. Do y'all remember that? In fact, it got him hit in the mouth. Do you remember that? Y'all were here last week? Let, let's go back. Y'all looking at me. Verse 2, chapter 23. What did he just said in verse 1? You see the, a similar word in verse 1, chapter 23? What's the word? I just read it in chapter 24. Conscience. What did he say? I try to live in a good conscience before who? Before God. Until this day. Up to this day, I have been living clear conscience before God. When he said that, what happened in verse 2? I don't know if Sister Sabrina did this perfectly because y'all were listening to this video last week as we, you know, I was here, but I wasn't here. But they, they, they paused the video perfectly online. It made me look like I was hitting myself. Did y'all see that? Y'all y'all didn't watch, did watch the video again? But if you get online and look at it, you'll see, it looks like I am hitting myself. Because I actually pretended, I said he was smoke on the mouth and did you pause it? No. That, so that was something they did on their own. Whoever gets these videos up. Made it look like I was punching myself in the face. Well, when Paul said he lived with good conscience before God last week, the high priest had them ordered them to smite him in the face. Remember, he got mad. He got upset. He, he said, why are, you, why are you smiting me? And you are like a whitewashed tombs. You are whitewashed walls. Well, this week he opens with the same words. Verse 16, herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense towards God. I don't want to offend my Savior. I don't want to offend my God. I want to live every day in such a way that I bring glory to him and not offend him. Lord, help us. Can, can we find some application in that tonight? Yes. What did he tell the other churches? What did he tell the Corinthians? Whatsoever you do, do to the glory of God. So if what you are doing is not glorifying God, stop it. If you cannot glorify God with your behavior and what you're doing and how you're doing it, whatever it may be tonight, saints of the most high God, cut it off. Stop it. In fact, that's just the way we should live. Whatever I do from the moment I wake up, even when I'm asleep, Lord, help my thought life, all those things. To the moment I lay down, let it bring glory to you. But watch this. A conscience void of offense towards God. And then he says, and toward men. Watch that. Watch that. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. If you are living to glorify God, chances are... You won't do anything to men that would be a sin or wrong. Hmm. I guess I need to get my shovel out and dig a little bit deeper. In fact, let, let's say it this way. You can't just say, I'm glorifying God, but then be rude to your fellow man. Let me, let me let me come on down your road a little bit a little bit further. Can I get on the pew with you? I know you're not on pews tonight, but that's a figure. Can I say it? I can't sing that I love the Lord. I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. Then tell somebody off in my house, in my family, on my job, at the church. You, you got to match it up. He he is saying here, and I'm trying to help you with the application because it's hitting me. It's hitting me as well. Notice this. You cannot live with just a clear conscience towards God, but have a dirty conscience towards men. Can I keep digging? We might as well just dig a big hole for all of us because in the end, watch this. Number one, God already knows who you are and how you are and what you are and why. You are, and eventually, if you keep trying to, to live on both ends of the road, men will know who you are and how you are. Yeah. Now, the, 
the, the hope of the resurrection is central and foundational to Christian truth. So notice what Paul centers on. Back it up to verse 15. He said that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. I got a little bit ahead of myself, but you get, you get what he's saying here. He is centering there. There's a pivot point. The Acts of the Apostles, there's a pivot point. Why did they act? Why did some of those apostles, they, they were hiding before the resurrection. But then after the resurrection, they were bold. Remember, that was one of our key words uh, 18 chapters ago, chapter 4. And when they got done, after they had been arrested, they didn't go back into hiding. They went and prayed, and the place was what? Shaken. And then what did they pray for? That the police would help them out? What did they pray for? That God would smite their enemies? No. What did they pray for? They prayed for boldness. Amen. Why were they bold? They were bold because they had experienced, they had seen, and the Apostle Paul was one of them. That's why he's an apostle, because of the resurrection of Christ. We sum it up in a song we sing every now and then, because he lives. Amen. Because he lives. Now, this hope of the resurrection... Brother Tyrone back there told us just a few moments ago that the Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees did not. Yet they disputed that Christ had arisen. And if you go back it up a, a little ways to the Gospels, you remember they even the high priests and the leaders rolled us a stone in front of Jesus' tomb. Right? Then, then later, a little bit later after that, the second day that he had been buried, did they not, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, or around in there, they posted guards. Just in case these disciples will come and try to steal his body away. Amen? So, get this, they disputed Christ had risen after his crucifixion. They believed in the end time resurrection and no one can triumph over death without Christ and believing in his resurrection. Amen? So, get this. The resurrection was the pivot point. Paul is appealing to them and he says, I worship and I'm worshiping because the Christ, the God that I believe in, has raised his son from the dead, and not only that, but there will be a resurrection and a judging of the just and the unjust. What does that mean? Yeah. Now, Christians will be judged for their works, they will receive rewards or lack thereof. But those who have rejected Christ will be judged for not having Jesus as their Savior. Amen. Now, not after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation, verse 17, and offerings. Whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult, who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had ought against me. Or else let these same here say if they have found any evil doing in me while I stood before the council. Except it be for this one voice and I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. So they charged him with several things. They charged him, back it up to several verses, that he was an insurrectionist, he, he was a ringleader, he was a disturber of the peace, and now what are they charging him here with? Blasphemy. Blasphemy. But this charge of blasphemy was without merit. If you remember, he is, he is uh, bringing back to the point of when he went in. Remember when the council recommended that he go in and, 
and purify himself uh, back in, in chapter 21, verse 25. And he purified himself and, and entered into the temple to show that he had no op with the Jews. He did this on purpose. Remember I told you, and we kind of went through the fact that uh, sometimes there's things that we must do to help call or not cause other believers to stumble. All right? The lawful and expedient part. Some things are lawful but not expedient. The, 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 the point of this is he did this so that they might attach themselves and understand that he was not cutting off the Jews. He was not in some separate sect, but he was worshiping the Christ that came to fulfill the law of the Jews. Jesus himself said, I've not come to do away with the, with the law. I've come to fulfill it. But they are charging him with blasphemy. Why would Paul go into the temple to comply with the ordinances and the rules and the sacrificial offerings and give alms to the poor and then defile the temple by taking a Gentile in with him? All right. They were hoping to destroy his credibility. Remember what we said a few, a few words back. Character assassination. Amen. I've said it three times, I think, since we began this series, and I think it works right here. Mark, third chapter, and the Bible says in verses one through six, and Jesus came into the synagogue, and the Bible says, and there was a man with a withered hand. And then it says, and they watched him. All right? Now, freeze. They weren't watching a man with the withered hand. They were watching Jesus to see what he might do to the man with the withered hand. All right? Now, Jesus said, stretch forth your hand. Brought him up front. Stretch forth your hand. man. When the man stretched it forth by faith, he was healed. And then the Bible says he began to glorify God. So he turned from a withered to a worshiper. So now, if I may take a detour and go down this rabbit hole with you for just a few minutes, if you want to follow me, you're very welcome to. I found this to be true of church. There are withered folks that come. Hallelujah. There are watchers who come just to watch and see what they might say, how they might accuse how they might see if you're breaking some law or some something just to see what kind of shoes you got on. <laughs> to hear what the choir sings, to see what the preacher says, to see how late sister so-and-so comes in, to see who sister so-and-so comes in with. There are watchers. Help me, Holy Ghost. But then don't miss this. Don't miss this while you're listening to what I just said. There are also worshipers. They don't care what the watchers are doing. They're glad that the withered are here because they realize that once they were withered. Amen. And they turn to a worshiper not because they did it themselves, but because a worthy Christ. Hallelujah. You got that in church. You got four W's. Yeah, you're going to have your watchers. Yeah, you got some withered folks. And yeah, you got some worshipers. But make sure you have a worthy Christ in the midst with you as well. Because he is the only one that can turn the withered and sometimes the watchers into worshipers. You missed your chance to shout right there. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Paul realized they were watching him and what he was doing. Delivering charitable gifts to fellow Jews is hardly an act towards someone who you are supposed to despise. Here, I despise you. I'm going to give you a charitable act or a gift. That doesn't sound right. That's, that's, that's anti. That's different. That's, that's not correct. That's opposing. We must seek to live a life above reproach. This honors our Savior and Lord. Moreover, the men who were there couldn't explain what Paul had done wrong when he had stood before the Sanhedrin, except that he had affirmed what? The resurrection of the dead. Something which, one more time, the Pharisees agreed with. 
So, so what law have you broken, Paul? What, what, what rules have you broken? What have you done wrong? How did you blast him? He, and he's saying, I, I've done nothing wrong. Verse 22. Felix's wife was a Jewish, uh, a Jewish woman or Jewish person. I missed the word there. And may have been the source of information about, there's your, their, your watch phrase, the way. Now, we are introduced to who some, some insight as to who Felix is here. I already told you he was hated by the Jews. And he had had many of them done in. But there's more to Felix than meets the eye. Check this out. And when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of, of that way, he deferred them and said, when Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. So just wait till Lysias get here, and then we'll, we'll figure it out. All right? And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or to come unto him. So now Paul's back kind of under house arrest, but he's doing pretty good. Remember, he had been in Herod's praetorium, and now he is in uh, another area, and he's under house arrest. He is allowed to have people come and go, and he has some freedoms. One more time, what we said last week, even in moments of persecution and imprisonment, and whatever that may be, God will give you a reason to praise. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Ah, he, he, and this is nothing new to Paul. I'm trying to move on. I'm trying to move on. But, but remember back in chapter 16 and at midnight, hallelujah, Paul and Silas sang and prayed and sang praises unto God. So won't God bless you? Amen. In the midst of your time, in the midst of your persecution, won't God bless you in your prison moments, in your persecution moments with a praise? Yes. And after certain days when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul. That's what that word should have been, Jewess. He sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. So stop right there. Felix asked Paul to come and speak to him. Amen. Y'all still with me? He asked a preacher <laughs> to come and talk to him. Y'all still with me? He asked someone who was used to Digging into the layers of people and delivering the gospel in such a way to come talk to him. Why did he do that? I often say sometimes when they've asked me at school and asked me at this place or that place, would you say a word? Would you speak to them? I'm like, you sure you won't give the preacher a mic? I didn't always used to say that, but now if you give me the mic, I, I may get confused and, and you may end up hearing something. No, I won't be confused. It'll be on purpose. Uh, you may end up hearing something from the Lord. And as he reasoned of, listen, let's watch this, as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix did what? Trembled. Woo! So he asked Paul, come talk to me. You intrigue me. But after Paul opened up his mouth and began to reason and talk about righteousness, Felix began to tremble. Amen. Let me pause and help you here. If you know the Lord and really know him, now don't play, don't play. Sometimes it's not you. It's not you that, that people do this to. It's just simply the spirit of the Lord that may be upon you and how you say what you say and what what the Lord uh, does in your life that may cause people to be a little bit uneasy. Amen. I just thought they didn't like me. No. Sometimes they just see the Holy Spirit moving and working and they, they see scripture being played out in your life and the things that you say, it may cause people to be a little bit cautious. Amen. On the flip side, sometimes they give the preacher the mic, and sometimes they say, no, don't give him the mic. <laughs> Amen. Because we don't want to hear 
what he or the Lord has to say. So notice, watch this. Felix trembled and answered. Watch what he says. Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for you. I will call for thee. What's he saying? Somebody translate that for me. Yeah, get out of here. I'm under what? Conviction. So watch this. Felix's wife was a Jewess, and having been uh, his source of information, notice this. Uh, Paul is asked to come and talk to them, and then once he gets there, notice this. He speaks about righteousness and lacking self-control. Why would that cause Felix to tremble? Because Felix had taken somebody else's wife. Oh, mm -mm. back it up. That's what got James in trouble, wasn't it? And Herod, am I right about it? He told him exactly what was wrong with him and, and what he had done was wrong and what was happening was wrong. All right. And so here we have one more time. Here we have one more time. Felix has invited Paul in to speak and Felix was evidently interested in some religious matters but then the conversation turns into speaking on sin y'all with me and when he begins to speak on sin then that's when Felix starts to tremble <laughs> to squirm Anybody ever been there? I'm not going to ask you to implicate yourself because everybody in here can raise their hand. I was in church and then the preacher started preaching on sin. How did he know? He didn't. The Lord knows. Because you cannot hide. Amen? Christians should understand that there are opinions out there uh, all about the word of God and about the things and, and what people consider truth and what is truth and what is not truth. And many times when we represent truth, we won't be liked, but it's not always us. It is what the truth is that people don't like that causes them to squirm. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Don't tell nobody that they lack self-control. Evidently he did if he took somebody's wife. Amen. Look at your handout. We are living in a time where there are many different Christians, all with different opinions. Y'all heard me, didn't you? Some right and some wrong. There are many different Christians. Come on, y'all. Acts 2 versus Acts 17. Y'all do get this. You, you have to understand who God is to somebody may not be who he is in Scripture. My God wouldn't do this. Have you heard somebody say that? Well, that's not what the scripture says. What is God's word has been compromised, and that's why we're in this sermon series on Sundays. Check it out, because truth cannot be taken out like we play the game of Jenga. We say, well, it's okay. We'll just take this out. Jesus is the Christ. He was virgin born. God's word is sufficient. We don't need all that. We just need love. No, you need all of it. So what somebody says about scripture, what somebody says about who God is, what somebody says about what who Christ is, and what somebody says about what sin actually is can mean different things for different folks. Yes. Back when I was really into baking sweet potato pies. Oh my. Yes. When you were back when you were really into it? When I was really into it. Oh, okay. It, gotcha. It, it was, it was a constant thing. Yeah. I took one to work one day. Uh-huh. And the first one I took, it was right. Everything was right about it. Everybody loved it. Mm-hmm. I took another one to work. Yeah. And I forgot one ingredient. Oh. <laughs> and everybody said, what, what, what's wrong with this pie? <laughs> Something ain't right here. That's a great analogy, brother. So you took one thing out and it changed the it whole thing. <laughs> So how's that connect? Go ahead, finish it. How's that connect with what scripture is? Everybody likes the sweetness of the pie. Mm -hmm. but not. Yeah. But when I told him, I said, I'm looking out for your sugar intake. <laughs> 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 
I hear you. I hear you. So you took the sugar out. Uh, I was going to help you out, but I'm going to leave you alone on that one. The analogy is very simple. He, he made a wonderful point. If you take things out of God's word, it's going to change its, its taste, its consistency, what it's supposed to do. And the word of God is sweet. <laughs> Sweeter than the honey and the honeycomb. No, notice his words. We're about done. We're about done. Notice his words. When I get an opportunity, leave me. Verse 25. Go thy way. And when I have a convenient season, those of you who have witnessed before, have gone out, have witnessed to, to family, have you ever been told that? I, I'll talk to you later about it. When I get ready, amen, I hear you. I, 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 I'm, and, and, and I'll talk to you sometime. And I, I don't have time right now. So you're ready to go. <laughs> yeah. You ever had that happen? First of all, they were squirming. And then second, they got to go. I'm not going to try to be funny tonight, but maybe this might be. You You have a lot of family over. Maybe some of them aren't quite where they need. You, you talk about the Lord. Get talking about the Lord sometime. That'll break the the, 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 the dinner and everything up real quick. I, I got oh, I to go. I got stuff, and they'll come up with all kinds. But you know what? People squirm. They, they'll tell you when I get an opportunity later. You, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but but later there's going to be another guy he speaks to, and he's and the guy says at the end, almost thou persuadest me, Paul. Mm. Christians who witnesses here, and the subject of righteousness is a serious thing. Go to the hymn, uh, and I believe it is uh, the solid rock. Yeah, and I think it's around the third verse of that hymn, and it says... And, and when I stand before him, and it says, faultless to stand before his throne. Did he just not say in, in, in one of the previous verses about the just and the unjust and judging? Faultless to stand before his throne. Then what does it say? Dressed in his righteousness alone. That's before that. Then it says, faultless to stand before the throne. Righteousness is a serious subject. If you are saved, then here it is. The Lord has exchanged your unrighteousness for his righteousness. There is a transfer. There, there is an exchange. So when Paul goes to talking to Felix about righteousness, then get this. Notice this. He was squirming because he realized he wasn't living righteously. Amen. So during this time with Paul, Felix allowed his moment of conviction to pass, and there is never a convenient time to hear about one's sin. Nobody wants to hear about that. Amen. Yet Paul himself said it best in his second letter to the Corinthians, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I will close with this. Whenever the invitation to discipleship is given, that is a very important time in the service. It is not a time to talk. It is not a time to check your messages. I've asked this church here, whenever the, disciple, the call to discipleship is given, that is a time when all who are blood washed, born again believers should be praying that people who are not hear the word of God and that they listen to to the Holy Spirit and if he is calling their name if he is calling to them if he is tapping them on the shoulder so to speak that they hear the voice of the Lord but so many times we are distracted and the, and the enemy is a master of distraction amen if he can get someone to get to the point of Felix and say I'll wait for another opportunity I'll talk to you about it tomorrow. You ever seen people, maybe you were under conviction and, and you thought, I'll, I'll go up next week. I'll, I'll talk to the pastor next week. I'll, I'll give my life to the Lord next week. In fact, it, it, it was a song back in the 80s that the Winans sang, said tomorrow. I'll give my life tomorrow. I thought about today. 
But it's so much easier to say tomorrow. Felix missed his moment. Felix missed his time of conviction. Felix missed hearing the Lord's voice clearly and surrendering and saying and become acquainted with this risen Christ. He missed the moment. And two years later, Felix's life was gone. According to historians, he lost his life. He was assassinated. And we don't know if he ever took Paul up on it. In fact, he, his position was changed and, and, and Festus uh, will come into play next week. He missed his moment. Let's pray that others do not. Amen? Let's pray that we are on point and we let people know that now is the accepted time. Amen? Questions or comments about the lesson tonight? We're almost through Acts. We have about three or so more chapters, and the Lord will have taken us in, in a little bit under a year. Over a year. My bad. A little bit over a year. He will, we will have made. When did we start? Last May? June 23rd. June 23rd of last year. So we are now six days over a year. Wow. Y'all have been with me that long. I thought some of y'all that fell off the <laughs> Amen. Amen. Questions or comments? As, as usual, Sister Sabrina has all of the previous Bible studies cataloged up front. So if you miss one, obviously you can go and catch them on video, online, on the YouTube channel, also on Facebook, on our church page, and then you can have the paper copies as well. All right? All right. Let us go to God in prayer. Lord, we thank you tonight for this short lesson, chapter 24, and how you blessed and, and how you spoke and you are using Paul. And we pray, uh, Lord, that we see next week how you continue to use him in Scripture and how that applies to our lives and what we should do. Uh, we should attempt and seek to persuade those and, and get them to see the truth of your word and the gospel and that you are the risen Christ. There is none like you. We ask now that you bless the words and all those who were hearers, and let us be doers of the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you all.